Imagination is one of humanity's greatest gifts ever. Almost every invention that we can see around was once born in human imagination. Another beautiful manifestation of this human imagination is the literature that we have. One can't but agree to the fact that books can be incredibly influential when it comes to bringing transformations in our lives. And today on 23rd April, we're celebrating the World Book Day in order to promote reading for pleasure. So, how would you describe the beauty and mystery in books to a non-reader so as to inspire them to get into reading? Frankly, I don't know how. Uh, how do you get somebody interested in something uh, which you are interested in but the other person is not interested in? Uh, you all ha always we have to begin with something. It's, that's the only way in which you get interested. Uh, you read good books or you read books that you like. That's the most important aspect of reading. Once you start reading books that you, you like and then you go to love, then naturally you'll go, go on reading uh, more and more and then get more and more interested. That's the way we get interested in everything, whether it's the movies uh, or games or books. So the way you get interested in books is the same way you get interested in anything else, cooking. Uh, nowadays, lots of students are uh, interested in cooking. Uh, so you learn to bake a cake and then you want to go into more of that. You get interested in books in the same kind of way. So that uh, it, I don't know whether it's possible to, to tell someone about the, uh, the pleasure of books uh, if they really haven't uh, experienced it. The only way is you get to uh, begin and uh, books have all for the at least for the last 500 years books have been the way in which uh, we have learned to experience everything uh, at second hand uh, but we can't experience everything at first hand so it's only through books that it's not ju not just about knowledge uh, it's not just about subjects uh, the pleasure of knowing other people's minds uh, entering other people's lives all of this happens uh, has happened for the last 500 years only through books. The last 2000, 2000 or 3000 years there have been stories and uh, that's the one the way in which you get to experience other lives. Um, after all our own experiences of just one life and a pretty dull one at that. Uh, so how do you uh, get to know about the lives of others uh, whether it's a, a soldier in a war or whether it's romance, betrayal, whatever it is. Now all our emotions, all of them come to us in, um, in very uh, intense kinds of ways in the best kinds of books. Uh, so um, books have always been the way in which you experienced things. Now things are of course changing. We have other kinds of uh, ways in which you can experience things. Uh, the movies in the 20th century made a great change and then once the internet came of course there are other pathways too but at least for the pa past 500 years books have been central to humans mm, in terms of culture as well as in terms of civilization sir in our prescribed textbook we don't have much about shakespeare so how should we be familiar with shakespeare what should be our takeaway from shakespeare uh, i think that depends on uh, the first books that you read uh, that is very important. Uh, I don't think we should thrust books down anyone's throat. Uh, not, uh, never make a list of these great books that you ought to have read. No ought to here. Uh, so uh, if a child is interested in, in a particular um, area, if it's films, books about films, if it's sports, books about sports, the, the, uh, the first books that you read are very, very important. They should be engrossing. Uh, you should get immersed into that world and typically that's the way we have seen books. Books have always been seen as a way in which you enter another world and typically uh, young children especially when they are good readers, uh, they generally get, the term we use is getting lost in books and, uh, and all readers have had that experience. Uh, a visitor comes home and this child who's reading a book never notices this visitor at all and the visitor is outraged are uh, insulted because the child uh, didn't treat the person well because we have been lost in that book. So typically books are a, a kind of material thing through which we enter another world.
after a certain point you completely forget your uh, environment the atmosphere around uh, you enter another kind of world so if you get introduced to the right kind of books in the early phase later i think uh, the readers will know how to find their own kind of books at a later stage there is no need for much advice uh, no need for um, giving counsel about good books because they know how to find the good books in the early stage uh, getting books that are interesting that is the most important thing imaginative and interesting uh, never try to thrust uh, the so called good books uh, down the throats of children that's the worst way and and that's uh, one of the problems with shakespeare uh, shakespeare generally is introduced uh, used to be introduced when you were in the 8th or 9th standard and the language itself was uh, slightly daunting it was slightly difficult uh, people were not used to that kind of language and all that the children remembered is this funny kind of language with hath and doth and doeth and goeth kind of thing uh, and you you forget the real thing completely uh, so you are introduced later uh, and then uh, the initial uh, phase might be slightly difficult precisely because of this language that is unusual that we are not at home with but once you get used to that language shakespeare can open up an extraordinary kind of world and that's why if you look at all the great poets uh, people like keats for example all of them uh, they completely into shakespeare so uh, uh, i think uh, shakespeare should be introduced only at a stage when you are uh, ready for it uh, and uh, not in terms of the language difficulty Uh, itself uh, for especially for people in places like india where english is a second language that can be daunting uh, the getting through that difficulty of that language uh, that that uh, if you properly introduce them to the pleasures that await them once you conquer that difficulty that early difficulty it's only slight difficulty afterwards you get used to that kind of language but once you get that shakespeare opens up an extraordinary kind of uh, world partly because no other uh, writer in the english language has uh, shown so much of experience of every aspect of life uh, but it's not just in the question of comedy and tragedy uh, almost always when whatever be the difficulty that you have whatever be the uh, feelings that you have uh, the emotions that you experience shakespeare always has words for that in the finest kind of way mm, almost ev- every kind of experience uh, whether it's youthful love or later betrayal uh, i don't think that there's actually there's only one area that shakespeare has not portrayed in his place almost everything else he has uh, the one area and that is uh, a commentary i don't know whether it's a commentary on shakespeare or on life itself but shakespeare has never portrayed a happily married couple in his place <laughs> everything else is there uh, anger betrayal no one has portrayed uh, youthful love the intensity of youthful love the way he has done it in romeo and juliet the intensity the passion he he, he has uh, and it uh, and uh, as you you read shakespeare you you are wonderstruck at how one person could have experienced all these kinds of things every kind of emotion that is possible and then you convert that into the finest kind of poetry in shakespeare everything comes together uh, he he is the greatest dramatist that england has produced uh, and he is also the greatest poet that in uh, england has produced so all of these come together in his place so uh, to discover shakespeare is, is a wonderful thing for any uh, young person Uh, but i think uh, we always introduce shakespeare in the wrong kind of way as a prescribed text and uh, uh, students already have their difficulty with the english language and then they find this language which they feel is 400 years old uh, and uh, they just don't relate to that language itself so i think it sh- should be introduced in, in a slightly different kind of way but once uh, uh, students discover what shakespeare really is because shakespeare is at the center of the canon in the english literature no one has ever come anywhere near shakespeare in displacing shakespeare all the others 
you, you can have quarrels, uh, your own lists of favorite writers, favorite dramatists, favorite poets. But Shakespeare sits right at the center. No one has ever come anywhere near uh, Shakespeare's place as far as the English canon is concerned. And one of the tragedies that has happened in, in, in India is that uh, in our project of decolonization, we have uh, removed Shakespeare. Shakespeare used to be a compulsory in colleges for second DC. And now that has been taken away. And Shakespeare is no longer there. And uh, we tend to, I think it's, it's the wrong way to look at decolonization. And uh, that um, Shakespeare, the, the, the uh, allegation that uh, Shakespeare, we consider Shakespeare great only because Shakespeare happened to be a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, uh, which is com completely wrong. The, the, lang the language, there is a difficulty. I don't, I don't think it's obsolete because if you look at his uh, sonnets, uh, the language uh, of a sonnet is a kind of language that anyone would write a sonnet in nowadays also. If you look at the sonnets, l let's say by uh, 20th century poets, a lot of them the, um, write in possibly the same way that Shakespeare has written 400 years earlier. Uh, in his plays, of course, there is a certain kind of difficulty and some plays, of course, are much more difficult. In the early plays, for example, there is this love of word play. Um, so that there is a difficulty with the language. Uh, in its later place, by the time we come to the, the last place, there is this condensation of thought so that the language is always uh, trying to say much more than it can. So there is a difficulty there. But in, in the middle place, in place like for example, the Merchant of Venice or Julius Caesar, there is a, a lovely balance between the thought and the action and the language. And that's why, of course, these two plays are prescribed all the time, The Merchant of Venice or uh, Julius Caesar, because there you have this ideal kind of balance. In his early plays, Shakespeare loves this language. So there's a great deal of wordplay involved in plays like Love's Labour's Lost. Uh, again, uh, sometimes we might feel it is indulgent. But I think uh, if, you are if you introduce children to the sonnets, uh, there won't be much of a difficult. I'm sure you must have learned one sonnet or the other. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Uh, let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. And the language is a language that we almost speak, and not, not difficult at all. Once in a while, uh, there might be a problem with the word order, but once you get the hang of it, uh, there's no problem anymore. But Shakespeare is uh, somebody who uh, our children should be introduced to at the right age and in the right kind of way. Uh, the, the stories themselves are not a big deal. The trouble is we give them the stories of Shakespeare and generally some of the, especially if you take a play like Cymbeline or something, uh, the stories may seem ridiculous to some of the children full of murders, everyone killing each other and then taking revenge. Um, the, the logic is slightly bizarre sometimes. So the stories themselves at a certain age, yes, to know what Shakespeare was about, you can introduce them to the stories, but we must also know that the stories are not the thing. It is the, uh, the thought and the language, how, uh, how uh, every emotion, every feeling, every thought has been conveyed in so perfect terms in the way that no one ever has before or since. I think he, um, uh, one, one of the aspects of Shakespeare is that as you grow older, you tend to uh, love Shakespeare more and more, partly because you feel that, uh, that the complexity of experience is shown by Shakespeare in ways that um, young people may not be able to relate to. I think, um, I think if you are an adolescent, maybe a teen, a in your late teens, uh, Romeo and Juliet might be something that the children can't relate to. But otherwise, uh, not being able to relate to things, that, that's a problem. I don't know how it can be overcome because they have to like it. Uh, and primarily because they are brought up on uh, cartoons and Marvel movies nowadays, that there is a problem with the uh, thought itself. There is the, so much of our, uh, our entertainment is based on action so that the emotion behind, uh, the thought behind, um, all of that um, 
is given a miss and then students might find it difficult to relate to because if you, if you look at the typical marvel kind of of movies all the spider man superman kind of thing there's very little that is human in it uh, all you have is this iron man or metal man or terminator or whatever kind of and and we are wondering who will uh, defeat whom kind of thing so uh, there is nothing that is really human in it and the great writers are always uh, about the human world what it is to be a human what it is to be to fall in love what it is to be betrayed if you can't relate to human to the human uh, then uh, I, i think the problem is not just about books and about literature it's about something else uh, i really i really don't know how actually uh, to, stu- to children who have been brought up on this kind of um, literature uh, how how they uh, shift to the complexity of being human because uh, hum- being human is a very messy kind of thing there are no pure emotions it's something like the feeling that uh, all of you will have towards your parents when you are at your age right now uh, the worst enemies in your life must be your parents but on the other hand the people you love most will be your parents too uh, uh, so how do, how do you explain that how uh, that this terrible love and dependence all of that is there but on the other hand most of the time they are your worst enemies the people you hate most Uh, so uh, to be human is to have these kinds of very mixed messy kind of emotions uh, uh, everything together everything together there is no purity in human emotions uh, you hate and you love everything is part of a larger kind of package uh, whereas the cartoon kind of movies very clearly uh, have this simple purified uh, pure kind of emotions and uh, it's only later of course li- that you'll discover uh, very often um, with your actual experience how complex life can be uh, but uh, great literature always introduces you to that um, very early enough uh, so i think there there they can be a difficulty literature. the most important aspect of literature is that we can enter the consciousness of some other person that is what i value most in literature uh, because uh, we we really cannot enter into the minds of others however much however honest they are towards you you never know what they actually feel even if they are your children or your parents or your husband or your wife or your lover for whatever it is you never know what it what the other person's mind is like uh, on the other hand literature tells you Uh, what exactly uh, how complex these emotions can be uh, how people think so the only way in which we can enter other people's minds is through literature uh, so the great literature has always been about character what we remember from great literature uh, uh, is always the great characters uh, prime pri- precisely because we have been able to enter their minds in a way that we will never be able to enter the mind of the person sitting next to you in the classroom or in our office so uh, so literature above all has has shown human consciousness to enter the minds of others uh, and th- there's always uh, an empathy that uh, builds up when we read literature to to identify yourself with other people and nowadays we do that with the movies you go and identify yourself with the hero or the heroine when the hero bashes up 20 people you are the person who is bashing up those 20 people but it is always um, deals with empathy a complete identification with other characters shakespeare's remarkable achievement is that uh, no, the see shakespeare shakespeare completely enters uh, the character of another person uh, and that is why for example even when you have um, only a few lines cordelia in king lear has only a few lines Uh, but cordelia is unforgettable in the same way that for example let's say you know um, somebody who, who speaks in a particular kind of way your a, a classmate and 20 years later that person calls you uh, and then you uh, take a uh, pick up the phone and then uh, you c- cannot identify who the person is and then a few words later suddenly because of that the language and the way the texture of the words 
you suddenly realize it's this this friend with shakespeare every character has his kind of language uh, shakespeare is able to put himself completely into the shoes of somebody else so that it's not just about the thought and the character it's the language itself that changes in hamlet for example hamlet always repeats certain words three times what do you read words 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 no other character does that and throughout you have this kind of this this characteristic way in which some people speak uh, uh, he he completely identifies himself with the character and that is why for example uh, shakespeare has always been relevant in a way that other writers haven't been because what happens is in contemporary criticism we are always reading past texts according to our present norms especially in terms of things like feminism uh, and we find all the earlier writers wanting uh, they are not they are too male chauvinist they are male chauvinist pigs kind of thing with shakespeare on the other hand uh, if you look at his heroines shakespeare seems to be a feminist uh, 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 shylock for example was a villain when he was originally staged uh, the typical jewish money lending villain uh, by the 19th century when the jews are seen as victims of a christian culture you can stage the same play and make Sh uh, shylock the uh, tragic hero no words are changed nothing is changed but on the other hand we can see it uh, in, in as the human he is shakespeare always uh, sees uh, the the complexity of a human being and he always i uh, this extraordinary empathy he has when he uh, speaks as rosalind or celia he speaks as the way rosalind the real rosalind would have if we can think of a real rosalind whether it's hamlet or whether it's a villain uh, and the way he identifies himself with every character it's not just about the villains alone he he can understand why a villain has ended up in this kind of way Uh, he understands why actually shylock hates these christians so much because he has been spat upon on the rialto uh, so that uh, his great speech hath not a jew eyes uh, speech is so relevant even after 1945 and the holocaust uh, so shakespeare is always relevant because uh, the the character his characters are so human they are always relevant with other writers we can always say that uh, he belongs to that particular age he treats women this particular kind of way the woman uh, has been portrayed from a male gaze point of view but shakespeare you can't make these kinds of allegations at all uh, see language because at the end of it all we are dealing with language it's through language that everything can be conveyed we are, we see we we think of uh, human beings as this extremely exalted kind of creature only because we have language and there are we we belong to the family of mammals there are so many other mammals and if you look at uh, uh, the discovery or national geographic documentaries they lead family lives the way we do uh there's there'll be the mother lion the father lion and uh, playing with the children the same way that we lead family lives why do we think of ourselves as cultured because we can speak we have language uh they do not have language so uh, all our great achievements comes out of our use of language uh, we can uh, and yes books uh, the the um, the great thing about books is of course that all the knowledge that has been available up to a point could be transmitted to the next generation and when we did not have language or when we did not have writing every generation had to learn everything all over again the parents had to teach the children again and again and again and that's why uh, see what we think of as prehistory man mankind has been here for uh, nearly 2 lakh years and all we know of uh, man is uh, the way uh we know him for the last 10000 years and even the, the about the, the 7000 of the early years we really do not know anything history en enters the picture only when we have writing and once there was writing uh, the collected knowledge of every generation could be passed on to the next so that the next could build up on that uh, so the the invention of books is central to uh, our development as a civilized 
uh, 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 civilized people. And once uh, the printed books came into the picture, about 500 years ago, can you, you, you can see how actually uh, the knowledge of, uh, let's say, 1300 AD is the same as possibly the, the knowledge of 3rd century AD. Not much uh, took place, uh, advancement in knowledge actually took place uh, during the Christian interregnum actually. Uh, and then uh, around the 14th and 15th centuries you have printed books. Knowledge is uh, democratized in an extraordinary kind of way. Books become cheap. People can not uh, as cheap as we would as they are now, of course, but on the other hand, uh, books can be passed around. Um, books are published, and then look in 500 years, we have put man on the moon, and a, um, a smartphone in all of your pockets. Uh, all of that happens with books because then uh, you don't have to. Each generation hasn't doesn't have to learn things all over again. Everything is built on earlier knowledge. Uh, so there's an extraordinary explosion of knowledge that happens once the printed book enters the human world. Uh, and then of course there has been a, another kind of, a, of explosion with the internet. An extraordinary democratization where everyone reads things at the same time. Earlier a book was published in America, it took years to come to India and you had to go to some of the elite libraries to get access to those books. Now on the other hand, a newspaper that is published in New York or London, the person here in Calicut reads the newspaper at the same time that the person in London or New York reads it. Uh, and uh, and uh, you don't have to pay for that either. Complete, uh, uh, so knowledge has been extraordinarily democratized uh, in the last 20 years. The books did it 500 years ago. And then uh, at another level, um, there has been this democratization that is happening. Uh, right now. So we are, we are living through an extraordinary period. Uh, uh, we are living in the kind of period that for example uh, people in the 15th century were going through. People who saw books for the first time and then complained about how people had no respect for books. It was only pornography that was being published now. Earlier it was the um, monks who wrote out the uh, religious books very valuable and kept it as codices in their monasteries. And then they suddenly discovered that every man in the street was getting these books and reading books, including the Bible, the translation and the publication of the Bible. And, and that actually created the Reformation and the uh, Enlightenment, uh, precisely because ordinary people could read uh, the Bible, uh, which was earlier uh, only the monks could read. Uh, so now something like that is happening. Uh, there's a level playing ground as far as knowledge is concerned. Uh, so. Uh, books have entered another kind of phase in the e-form. So between reading an e-book and reading the hard copy, which one would you prefer and why? I prefer the hard copy because I'm old. As simple as that. Uh, so people like me are people like the monks of the 15th century who saw all these cheap products that everyone was able to read, whereas they had this lovely illuminated manuscripts in their monasteries and I thought those were the books, these weren't really books. Uh, so I am used to this, I love handling books, I love the smell of books, I like to underline um, books. Uh, so I, I want to handle it uh, with a Kindle, I have a Kindle but I rarely read books on Kindle uh, because for me they are not books. But I, I, it doesn't mean anything except that I am old. I grew up with uh, material books. Youngsters read it on the Kindle and uh, reading at the end is reading. It's not about let's say reading a book is better than reading a Kindle. That is rubbish. Both are reading the same kind of thing. I am at home with books. People like you will be at home with the Kindle. And the world is changing. Uh, so in a generation, um, people, everything will be on Kindle. Uh, people of the next generation will be looking on books the way now we look at the codices in those monasteries in Europe uh, ve on vellum copies, illuminated kind of thing. Part of the past, a technology of the past. Uh, so it's like let's say, uh, do you like to hear music on CD or video, uh, the cassette uh, or uh, let's say on your iPhone kind of thing. You are listening to the music and anyway that belongs to the past. Whoever listens to CDs anymore? Uh, so books, uh, I hope I am wrong 
you know books are coming partly because we are still uh, in an old technology and because books have become cheap too uh, especially in a place like india in the last 50, 30 years there has been enormous increasing purchasing power as far as the middle class is concerned uh, so um, you can buy a lot of books uh, an academic 50 years ago possibly couldn't have bought this kind of a, a library on his salary uh, on the other hand now books have become cheap so you can buy the uh, the books that you want but with kindle it's so cheap you don't have to pay anything at all so uh, it's going to be another uh, completely different kind of generation that is growing up books are there but uh, i think the 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 direction is in that in terms of the etic technology it's not in terms of paper and print now already for example all the encyclopedia uh, publishers have stopped publishing their encyclopedias uh, because they are so expensive and nobody is buying it because you have got wikipedia so uh, that is a marker of the future that uh, the encyclopedia used to be the great uh, let's say showpiece in any library every library had this encyclopedia britannica encyclopedia americana uh, that was the centerpiece of any library uh, nowadays now uh, not a single company is publishing an encyclopedia uh, because it's a it's time is over uh, the chinese have a saying the mandate of heaven is over for certain uh, dynasties uh, the mandate for books possibly is over uh, at least this material books hard copies is over but books of course um, will never uh, go out of fashion uh, there'll be the e-books um, because uh, everything that we see in the contemporary world has been built upon this accumulated knowledge of the last especially the last 500 years uh, that uh, will n not go out of fashion unless humanity is so extraordinarily stupid that they blow up the whole planet otherwise uh, they will remain uh, so it's not as if let's say if you read books you will become better uh, I don't I, I think of books as very valuable because they contain the collected knowledge of humanity but it's uh, uh, I don't don't think in terms of you re if you read a book you will become uh, good um, you can become just as bad by reading books um, in the same way that if you've been the right kind of person as a mentor you'll be transformed if you find the wrong kind of person your life will be transformed the wrong direction so uh, everything every, uh, everything in civilization is double-edged it's like Caliban in uh, the tempest says uh, you have taught me language and what is my profit on it I can curse you with it uh, so language can be used to bless it can be used to curse and uh, there are good books there are bad books the idea that if you read books you will become good I, I don't believe in that if you read good books yes if you re read bad books on the other hand uh, so uh, reading a book uh, doesn't mean that it has it, it has to be good any more than let's say see uh, uh, the, the best example that we have right in front of us is the smartphone half the problems of the younger generation are caused by the smartphone uh, so uh, but on the other hand uh, all the achievements are also because of the smartphone so anything and any, anything from language onwards fire uh, all, all our products have been double-edged how we use it is important uh, let's say when we uh, build the atom bomb we had the same kind of problem we could destroy our planet with it on the other hand we could create a lot of energy cheap energy at that uh, so with uh, books with e-books with the internet with the ex exposure always is double-edged when we uh, send our children out into the world there's always a danger but we have to do that uh, and uh, we give the best kind of advice the best kind of mentoring so that the exposure will be the right kind of exposure so that their lives will be fruitful but going out set, uh, sending our children out into the world is always dangerous uh, so exposure is always dangerous we have to we have to at a certain age uh, we have to send children out into the world uh, in India we cling on to our children 
uh, for me the ideal is something like let's say the birds and the uh, animals they look after their children in the early stage just as much as we do uh, if you have uh, seen uh, birds trying to teach their young to fly and once they learn to fly they go away they don't come back uh, we have to let go of our children uh, Arundhati Roy in her novel uh, her first novel dedication to her in her dedication to her mother she say she says dedicated to my um, she's she has dedicated to a, a number of people but the mother she says who love me enough to let me go we have to let go of our children uh, and letting uh, books possibly uh, are as uh, in, an introduction to um, the world of good books possibly uh, can make it safer for them because we cannot give all the advice one person one uh, set of parents cannot give all the knowledge all the advice that are necessary uh, so you teach them where to look for things how to find things and till very recently books have been the only way in which we got that kind of knowledge but now of course there are other things also so i don't think that like books alone um, should be the way uh, the books for uh, till uh, about till about uh, 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 half a century ago that might have been true but now there are other ways in which you, know, you get exposure to very often better ways in which you get exposure i don't like uh, reading um, being thrust on children as a duty if you read you read it for pleasure the moment you feel that you are not uh, getting any kind of fun out of that reading stop that reading read something else that gives you pleasure never read something because of a reading list that somebody has given uh, okay if you read uh, war and peace or the Bro brothers karma so then you will be well read no if you don't enjoy reading stop it you take a book somebody has i advise uh, you to read a particular book and you read and after 20 pages keep on for 20 or 25 pages uh, but uh, after that if you still feel that uh, you are not uh, enjoying it anymore stop reading it take something that you like and reading because the moment you stop uh, re uh, yeah, reading is no longer a pleasure then it doesn't serve any purpose so uh, shakespeare shakespeare uh, um, there are now a, a number of movies based on uh, shakespeare's uh, plays so you see those movies and uh, some of them are uh, use the same language of shakespeare but on the other hand uh, has been jazzed up for contemporary times. Uh, Bas Lurman's Romeo and Juliet, for example, is set in contemporary California. Uh, but the language is the blank verse of Shakespeare uh, it, with Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, so you read that if you like that, then you go on to uh, the place itself so that you, you begin to enjoy the, 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 uh, the power and the glamour of that, of that blank verse too because the language is everything in poetry the language is everything a thought is uh, most of the time the thoughts that you find in poetry that you love is the kind of thoughts that you have already had that's why let's say during moments of emotion we sing our favorite songs film songs or quote our favorite lines because somebody else has said the, has said the same thing that you have been feeling but in a way that you could never have said uh, so that language is everything and the way in which you say something in Shakespeare you have uh, the, the, the magnificence of that poetry together with the emotions that you can constantly identify with uh, at almost every age possibly I think uh, children will might have a problem especially children of nowadays but uh, from Romeo and Juliet onwards at every stage um, King Lear for example can be truly appreciated only when you're 80 when all your children have betrayed you and you feel that your complete life has been a waste because you looked after your children who have completely betrayed you and gone away uh, so it's only when you are you are uh, that age that you re realize the futility of having loved your children too much uh, so there's something for every age but the, the remarkable thing is that shakespeare uh, uh, by the time he was in his 50s he had packed up his bags and left london and come gone back to stratford and never wrote a line again but uh, he he could 
uh, put himself in the uh, uh, in the mind of a, a 70 or 80 year old man so completely 23 april is observed as world book day to mark the birth and death of the greatest dramatist of all times william shakespeare on this day we were indeed fortunate to spend time with professor nagesh former faculty of St. Joseph's College, Devagiri, Kurikod, in his house that qualifies as a house of books, filled with books in stacks and piles and shelves all around us. Let us savor the smell, the taste, the power, the promise and the beauty of these books till it is time to turn the page. Thank you.